coming to learn about robotics. Um, this is CS235, in case you're wondering which class you're in. Um, and it's a fly robot design for people who don't do it normally. And um, I had an interesting experience this weekend. I went to, for the first time, to a first competition. If you know what a first okay, good. Um, I was amazed <clears throat> at how many kids, you know, from like this age to this age were making robots and helping each other make robots. Um, the kind of teamwork we saw there, I saw there was just incredible. And my high school won, which <laughs> had nothing to do with it. I was not involved in it. It was hard for me. Uh, sorry? Uh, Menlo Atherton. I don't know the team number. But it was on the web. Uh, and these kids are so amazing. You know, they don't just like go head to head. They have uh, alliances where like three will be on one side helping each other. And later on, they might be opposing each other. But it's just, it's really great for cooperative uh, invention. And uh, so it's a good thing. So, what motivated this class? Well, <clears throat> for a long time, I've, I've been a mechanical engineer and worked with computer scientists. And one of the things that's always concerned me is that sometimes, not all of you, CS folks view robots as a black box. They figure out how we can wrap it, some code around it, and it'll work, right? That's actually not true at all. Um, if that robot has got backlash in it, or friction, or natural frequencies that are wrong, there's a lot of mechanical stuff that can go in there to make it very difficult to make a robot do what you want to do. And robots, in your time, our time, are getting beyond driving around and avoiding touching things. You know, like cars that don't crash into cars, or robots that deliver mail but don't touch anything. So we're kind of moving to a generation where robots are going to be physically interacting with things. And whether it's helping you walk when, when you're unstable, or handing you things and not letting go until you have control of it so you don't drop it on the floor. So physical interaction is going to be a part of what robots are doing in the future. And so this class is kind of about that. It's how, it's, it's like beginning from ground zero. How to build machinery, um, robots in this case, and it applies to lots of other machinery that works. Um, and more importantly, importantly, let's say you're in a position to you buy a robot. And you look at the spec sheet that says, you know, uh, inertia X and backlash Y and acceleration Z. What does that mean? Is that good or bad? What numbers are good in that area to tell you? <laughs> no, it's for you. Um, and uh, so, so it, 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 the next level down from what can robots do besides um, washing floors like a Roomba, um, the next level down is what mechanical properties should they have? And they come into? Should, should they be compliant? You know, what are the specs on a robot that hits you in the head? Well, the auto industry kind of knows about that, about airbags and acceleration and how much your body can take. We don't quite know what that means in terms of a robot that's got arms, um, you know, putting your dishes away or, or walking your kid or your dog or something. So um, back to the, the lowest level is how do you build such a robot? Um, and there are lots of skills ranging from visualization of, of what the shape ought to be, um, mechanical visualization of how it should feel when it operates, are the gears or the cables or the belts doing the right thing. Um, and, and then the level down is how do you build this thing? You know, I, I've worked with machinists for a long time and they can always tell somebody's never actually cut metal or saw it wood themselves. If you just design these kind of fantasy mechanical things, they go, you don't know what you're doing. Um, and they'll you know, keep the drawing back and say, do it right. Well, now you're at a time when you can go to a, a CAD system and then and then hit hit the print button. And that's essentially what's going to be happening here. You know, I predict 10 years from now, you can go to Kinko's and print a teapot or, or print, you know, a toy for your kid or something. I mean, this, this is going to happen. So a lot of the work that's going on here is going to have to be uh, is going to deal with creating shapes, understanding the mechanical uh, requirements of them, um, and then making them, and then most importantly, putting them together. I mean, to me, one of the most important things in robotics is getting um, a visceral sense of materials. You know, if you pick up a piece of wood, what is it? if you pick it up, and then it's just wood. But if you bend it, how stiff is it? When does it break? What's it smell like? What's it taste like? I mean, all these things count. And, and really good designers have a real gut feel for materials, so they don't have to go and do all the calculations. They can kind of say, this kind of wood, this kind of aluminum rod, this kind of bearing will do what I want to do, and they make it. And then maybe they go back and do the calculations to make sure it's not going to fall apart. Um, but um, So I think a lot of what folks will get out of this course is an intuitive sense of what's a good machine, how to make it, partly. We're not all going to be robot designers. Um, although jobs for robot for roboticists is up 40% this year, so some of them may well be roboticists if you go forward. Um, so sometimes when I describe our lab, I say that we make uh, a robot a week, which astonishes a lot of people. But in fact, since we've incorporated uh, 
a laser cutter machine that cuts up pieces of wood, which you'll see in a few minutes here, a 3D printer, um, and other means to develop robots with motors and mechanical um, connections and mobility to do whether it's moving or manipulating or acting like a haptic interface. Um, and I give a lot of credit for that Robot a Week moniker to Ruben, who's going to be your main guy for this course. Um, Ruben is a, a particularly gifted in making things. Um, and uh, I think he really wanted to share his enthusiasm for that in this course. So you're going to hear a lot about how to make stuff with Ruben. Hopefully you'll be able to see some of the things that he's made um, and enjoy doing some of this yourself. Um, the good news, maybe, is that there are many more of you than we can take. <laughs> and uh, I know that's going to be hard for some of you. So uh, Ruben's going to talk a little bit about how we're going to figure out who will be in this semester, this quarter's course. Um, there's so much enthusiasm for this that I'm, I'm hoping and thinking we probably will teach it, offer it in coming quarters. So we'll have to come up with an algorithm to help you decide, help us decide who's going to be in the course and not. Um, those who do get into the course, I urge you to make a commitment to it because you're here because, and not allowing somebody else to be here. So don't say yes unless you really can, can deliver. Um, today you're going to hear about what it is we're expecting you to be doing. And uh, I, I'm delighted to see you all here. So Ruben, you want to? Thanks. Okay. So I'm Ruben, and I'm a six year PhD student here, almost seven. I'm sorry. I'm not sure if that's a good thing or a bad thing in your eyes. But uh, actually, I'm going to talk to both sort of abnormally loudly uh, so that uh, the video camera can hear me, not because I had no other problems. So um, I'm going to just jump in with an um, example of what we're going to do in the first week because we have the rest of the afternoon to go over the syllabus and stuff like that, but that's kind of boring. So we're going to go ahead and I'm just going to show you what's what. So this is lab one. And you guys are building this from uh, start to finish. We're going to give you lots of help. Um, and what this is, is this is all gears. So these are all 3D printed gears, the white ones. And you can switch between the two. These will start moving in a sec. These are laser cut gears. And uh, this, uh, I don't know, it didn't take that long to design it. It particularly didn't take that long to build it and assemble it uh, because our machines are super precise. Uh, I know how to do it the right way. And once you know how to do it and you've got the right tools to do it, it's really fast. So. Um, to show you, uh, I'm showing it on, on YouTube instead of right here because it's kind of hard to be able to see. So those are helical gears that are spinning. Those are in a parallel configuration. And uh, can, you, can you all see this all right? Is it too light? Okay. You can see we have actually stacked them to become a herringbone gear to uh, eliminate some actual thrust loads. And uh, these are helical gears in a crossed or steel or orthogonal configuration. It looks kind of tricky because you wouldn't think that they should be able to actually mechanically turn. So uh, I didn't believe that that would work until I actually built it and it did work. And I squinted and said, okay, yeah, I can see that. So you see, the exact same gears are at a 40, uh, 90 degree angle now. So that's pretty cool. Uh, these are bevel gears here. They're different sizes. Again, that's at a 90 degree angle. Those are miter gears. They're very similar, but a little bit different. Uh, here on the left is a worm gear. And actually, um, I'll, I'll give you a demo of that later. We have the worm here on the tripod. And then up above, I'm going to skip ahead a sec. So that's all 3D printed. And basically the way that works is it's like an inkjet printer, only for plastic. And uh, later in the quarter, I'll show you actually I have some stainless steel parts that are 3D printed just the same. So, so these are, uh, this is a gear train. It's back diable. This you probably can see from your distance. See this all spinning? This is all laser cut plywood. And this is the stuff you find in your walls. It actually is a remarkably good prototyping material. So the reason I'm starting out with this is uh, this may look a, a mite bit complicated if you've never used a hand drill or perhaps used it and punctured your hand. Um, it's not. And this is what you're going to be doing, uh, I think the due date is next Friday, uh, because we're going to teach you how to do it and demystify it, and it's actually really not that difficult. So. Um, I'm going to start out by uh, putting the syllabus back up and telling you what this class is and um, whether or not it's a good idea for you to take it. So, the full, very unabbreviated title is CS235 Applied Robot Design for Non-Robot Designers. How to fix, modify, design, and build robots. So, we don't want people who already know how to build robots. That's not the point, because uh, then you'd be teaching the class. 
Um, and uh, so you say, okay, well, I don't really want to design robots. I'm a CS person, and I want to control them and use them, but I don't need to know how to build them from scratch. Okay, so say you have a robot, uh, PR2, or a wham arm, and it's the night before uh, paper deadline, and you're trying to get some data, and the wham arm freaks out and decables itself, and now you're stuck with no data and no paper because you don't know how to fix and recable your wham arm. Okay, well, you don't need to know how to build a wham arm from scratch and know all the math that went on to it, but you do need to know how to get out an Allen key and loosen something so that you can put it back on so you can just get your data and get your paper. Um, say, uh, say it never breaks, but you have a bunch of different little camera turrets for your webcam and you cut data for paper, and um, they all look the same, but you know one of them is a thousand bucks and one of them is fifty bucks, and you don't know what the reason would be and whether you should buy the expensive one or the cheap one. Well, if you know how to design robots, then when you look on there and you see one says uh, spur gears and has a backlash um, number on it, and then you see another one and it has a different mechanism that says, you know, near zero backlash, then you'll understand why the one that's more expensive is the better one to go with, and you'll get a lot better data. So you don't need to want to be building Terminator robots to need to understand Terminator robots. They have feelings. We, we must understand them properly. Um, so actually, you'll notice this is a CS class, and that we're taking a lot of CS people, and all of these justifications are the reason why CS is sponsoring this class, because they get a lot of lost student time and faculty time due to people not understanding the mechanism of robots when they really do need that. So um, I'm going to do the boring thing real quick. and. Um, Basically, it's, it's fairly expensive to uh, print all of this out. So it's online, it's on the website. I emailed it to you all last night. If you did not receive my email, please come see me after class because that means you missed some details. So I'm going to go through the boring stuff as quickly as I can. Uh, so um, Ken and I are co lecturing this class, and the lovely Rob Wilson is here on the camera. So take a nice stare. Okay. <laughs> And so what are we going to be teaching you in this class? Uh, as much as we can cram into 10 weeks. And we'll be do using hydraulic pressure, so it's quite a bit. So we're going to be going over motors, unusual actuators like pneumatic, hydraulic, piezoelectric, shaping your alloys, solenoids. Uh, we're going to be doing how do you sense position and velocity and forces and accelerations. Uh, we'll be doing every type of mechanical widget you've ever seen. So these gears, belts, pulleys, cables. Um, Counterbalancing things so they don't fall over, like uh, some of the old school Apple monitors that just kind of float. They're counterbalanced. There's a way of doing that. Wheels, how do you make robots go places? Uh, how do you make them safe so they don't clip people's fingers off unless, of course, that's their intent? Uh, standard mechanisms, parallelograms, the stuff from the 1800s. Okay, so we're only taking 25 students because it's a very small prototype of chop downstairs. Once you see it, you'll understand why it's a little bit of a shoebox with very expensive equipment. And um, we'd like to take all of you, but we can't. So basically, at the end of the course of uh, today's lecture, I'm going to have you all fill out a questionnaire. It should take about 15 to 20 minutes. And basically, that lets uh, us get to know you better, what your technical background is, uh, some of the practical stuff, such as do you have time to be taking this course? Uh, have you already taken every course on the man or robotics so that's going to be useful, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and basically, uh, we'll take a look at those tonight. And by midnight, I'm going to send you all a uh, yes or no. Um, if it's a no, please don't argue. If it's a yes, please um, come tomorrow. We're going to be starting very quickly. We have a lot of safety overhead and training and access and SolidWorks, etc. Um, so basically, before you can start do, build, building awesome robots, we have to get you set up with that. So it's going to start very, very quickly tomorrow afternoon. Uh, if you don't get in, but you'd like to keep coming to lectures, I welcome you. You're free to audit it. We don't have enough space or materials for everyone. Uh, who's auditing to do the labs in front of the project, so you won't be down there getting dirty, but the upside is you'll be clean. Um, so we will come the lecture, and, uh, but we just won't have you do labs. There are no prereqs for this course, none whatsoever, um, but we would prefer that you know some C++. Let me put it this way, at least half of you have to be decent at C++, because in the end we're building robot arms that are going to be programmed and moving, and the teams are teams of two, so at least one of the other team has to know it. So if you know, we get a bunch of people who know C++ and some who don't, I'm going to be doing it about 50-50 just so that you can control your robots. 
Um, I'll let you read through the, the degree requirements. It, it basically it fulfills electives and nothing else. There's no textbook for this class. Uh, as hokey as this may seem, um, it's basically Wikipedia and YouTube because they're awesome and they're free. And uh, I encourage you all later to go and just type in gears to YouTube. I've spent literally days of time just gazing at various, very strange concoctions of gears. However, there is a lab fee because um, everything you see on this desk is fairly expensive. We're going to be giving it to you because you need it to build your labs. And um, at the end of the quarter, you get to take probably 95% of it all home to keep. You get to keep basically all of your prototypes. I'll let you guys figure out how to divvy up your final project, but it's all expensive, and because of that, we need your help with it. So there's a $150 non-refundable lab fee. Uh, that seems pretty steep. Please don't sell any kidneys. Um, our justification is a standard textbook were we to enjoy reading for a class like this would be Mark's Standard Handbook for Mechanical Engineering. It's 200 bucks. So, you know, it's on par. We don't have a textbook, but we do have a lab fee. In the end, it's about the same amount of money. Computer. Uh, let me show you why you need a Windows laptop. Now, I know some of you, especially the CS people, are thinking, dear God almighty, why Windows? <laughs> and, um, I understand. Please don't be too bitter. So, can everyone see this? I'm doing sort of a weird kinematic version of my brain right now. So, this is SOLIDWORKS. So, that Lab 1 that's sitting right here on the desk, uh, before it was Lab 1, in its um, computer room, it was this. And, um, so this is basically how you design everything, and I can drag things, I can, uh, I can zoom in, I can open parts, I can get a better look, this is a helical gear, it's a high helical gear, away. So this is SOLIDWORKS, and SOLIDWORKS in its infinite wisdom decided to make its uh, software available only to Windows. So that's why you need a Windows computer. As far as a laptop, um, here's how it goes in mechanical design. You build something, it looks amazing and perfect, and you bring it to the shop and you cut it and you assemble it, and it doesn't work. And it never works. It doesn't work for me, it doesn't work for Ken. I can count on the number of, on my you know, one hand, the number of times things have ever assembled properly for the first time. So then you're going to go, oh, I forgot this, this, and that. You're going to go back, type it into your SOLIDWORKS, fix it, reprint it, and then it works. That's how, how it's done. So you're going to need to be able to do SOLIDWORKS um, in the lab, in office hours, in special lectures, where we're training you on SOLIDWORKS. Some of it will be here in class where we're doing particularly hard things together. So you need to be able to do SOLIDWORKS on the go. Also, um, when you're controlling your robots, we're going to be plug and play USB electronics for motors and sensors, etc. And uh, unless you want to be carting your entire desktop in a book bag, uh, which I've done, you need a laptop. So, um, the, the two main required things uh, for this course are the $150 non-fundable lab fee, pay for your, your sundry mechanic widgets, and a Windows laptop. And the details of what flavor don't really matter, but they're, they're listed here. In terms of grading, uh, we expect you to show up. So the 10% of chance, this is very hands-on. And the whole point of this course is hands-on. That's why it's not an online course. So um, if you want to understand and be able to do the projects in labs well, you need to be here. So basically what it is, is uh, if you show up for at least all the lectures except for two, you're just going to get 100 for the attendance. Uh, if you miss more than two, you get zero for the 10% attendance. There are no tests here, and so we split the rest of the grade between labs and final project. Labs are 65%, and there are probably about five or six of them. Final project is 25%. So speaking of the final project in the labs, labs are all stuff like this that teach you how to use something, topic, really, really well. And so I've thrown about every gear that you're gonna end up using for the first couple of years of design in here. Um, so we'll be doing gears and belts and cables of mine. And um, then the final project basically puts it all together and gives you a second stab at it. Because with mechanical design, seeing it once is good, but seeing it twice is really where you start to understand you know, hey, last time I did it this way and it didn't work as well, and so I'm going to fix a few things and give you a second snap at it. Tentatively, and all this is tentative, mind you, um, the final project is going to be uh, groups of two people each building uh, four to five degree of freedom robot arms. Now, does everybody here know degree of freedom? DOF, UF. So that's a joint, something that moves in, one, in, in just one axis. So four to five uh, degree of freedom robot arms pick up little things on the table, um, that seems really, really hard right now. It will get much less hard as the quarter progresses. 
Um, you're, you're free to work together, just don't cheat. That one's a no-brainer. Office hours, uh, Rob and I will be downstairs in the lab, first floor Clark, you'll see Salisbury Robotics uh, at the time. Um, and we're going to basically be doing office hours probably seven days a week, mainly because we just can't have that many people in the lab at one time, it's pretty tiny. Uh, so one of the main challenges of this course, and it's not just this course, but we can't design it, you know, scheduling your time and planning that properly. Whereas with um, analytical or theoretical sets where you're chugging out math and you can read the book until five in the morning, you can't do that here because you'll lose a finger or 25 people will be trying to use one laser cutter uh, or you'll get the first prototype built, it won't work and you'll never have time to iterate. So um, we'll have some requirements about it. When the labs go out, you have probably two days to do your first iteration, just to, to do something, so get your solid report and you show us. And then we'll have little goal posts along the way in the week to make sure that you all are spacing out properly. Um, the good news is office hours are made in late afternoon and evening for the United Animals, which I'm guessing is most of you, and uh, some on the weekends. So no 9 a.m. office hours where we all hate ourselves. Um, in the end, we're going to show, throw a big party and show everyone the awesome robot arm you built. And please bring your family, friends, colleagues, and we'll have a lot of famous people here who try to coach you and hire you before you graduated. Don't let them. But um, for the haptics class, yes, 277, we have like the people who invented the little thumb mouse thingy on the laptop show up. And that's a pretty big deal to you have. Um, safety, we're going to go over this basically like after today, but uh, you know, Stanford doesn't like you using power tools, so we are going to be really careful about that. Um, so yeah, I'll spare, see, seeing as some of you uh, won't, sadly won't be with us later in the week, I'm going to save some of this. Um, onto prototype quality, I'm a stickler for this, and this is really going to my other points. So uh, our lab downstairs is often called a rapid prototyping facility, which is true. So let me tell you what rapid prototyping is. Uh, when people build things like for companies, generally they send it and it gets made out of metal, aluminum or steel or some exotic something with a magnesium alloy. Uh, and it takes forever and it's really expensive um, and it's just, it's just terrible most of the time. So before they start making these in the quantities of thousands and millions. Um, they start out with sort of rough sketches built out of plywood and 3D printed plastic. It's rapid because it doesn't take weeks and it doesn't take thousands and thousands of dollars to do it. Um, but as you can see with this, all of my uh, gears mesh absolutely perfectly, just as if I had ordered them from Stock Drive or Misumi or wherever I ripped off the cat from. And uh, so all of these have the proper amount of backlash and play, and I'm using actual, I've got actual shafts and shaft collars and bearings. This is not duct tape, this is not glue. And um, there are many, at other uh, lesser institutions, there are courses perhaps similar that basically focus on foam core, exacto knives, duct tape, and hot glue. That is not this class. But when we say rapid prototyping, we mean that we were doing things out of laser cutting and 3D printing prior, getting the machine that is limited in steel. Um, it will be fast, but actually what the way we view it is we're going to teach you to build robots the right way. It also happens you'll be doing it quickly. But that doesn't mean you're going to we're teaching you how to build robots quickly with the poor quality. Um, and so one might ask, well why does this matter, you know, because I just I want like sort of a kinematic mock-up of what I'm doing and so foam core duct tape are totally fine. It matters because first impressions really matter. So um, if I were, you know, pacing and stuttering and sweating profusely and you guys came in here, you'd probably have a bad first impression of me. Such is the same with mechanical prototypes. So if you have this awesome invention and you go to your boss or your professor and it looks like crap, even if it sort of works, but it looks like crap, they're going to be like, hey, wow, that's awesome. It looks like crap. <laughs> I'm not interested. And so that's doing you a disservice and your widget a disservice. And I have done this where I showed people and there was a big letdown because it looked terrible. Uh, as such, we want things to look nice. It was actually a funny anonymous story of someone who, um, they were building something really cheap and dirty. They never expected anyone to see it ever. A photographer came through our lab, was snapping interesting pictures, and they snapped pictures of famous things that Ken built former PhD students who started company built. I mean, things that have been sold in the thousands now. 
And then they took a picture in the corner, stuffed away of this terrible looking thing that they never expected in a million years anyone would be publicizing anywhere. And now it's, you know, uh, been seen by thousands of people in pictures by Stanford. So, you know, this is why you, even if it's just for your own careers or you and your advisor, you want to build things well to get across your idea um, without, you know, having aesthetics unfortunately get in the way. Um, so, at this point, let me tell you the main true fabrication techniques we'll be using, seeing as we won't be using what? Okay, and also the real expensive version of the duct tape. Aluminum steel machine. So, 3D printing. Basically what this is, uh, and, and you guys will see this later uh, downstairs in the lab, is um, it's got a little nozzle, it moves in X, Y, and Z or problem axes, and it just sports out a little bit of plastic, and it hardens, and so then you get 3D parts. It's basically like really, really, really thick inkjet printing. There are lots of different types, I not four three different types, although I would explicitly give them to you. And uh, so passing around, these are 3D printed objects, and these are gears. And if you spin one, they all spin. And now, someone tell me if this is mechanically possible to do if you didn't 3D print this. You pass these around here and pass the reverse direction. Okay, now that notice that some of these are not hard. Some of these are softer than others. So basically, you get very good on them. Can anyone give me an example of a very soft barometer object? That's what I'm looking for. But we'll start out with an example. Soft barometer. Good. Okay, so what is barometer? It's basically squishiness. It's my super fantastic precise definition. Um, so barometer is basically the squishiness. So the cool thing about some of these 3D printers is you can do things all the way from stainless steel to squishy stuff. And with these, you can do hard stuff on part of it, squishy stuff on other parts of it. So you can imagine a swim fin for a robotic fish uh, where it's very rigid here at the coupling so it doesn't flex too much. And then at the end, it's very floppy. Um, and they've done this, and I'm not making that up. So um, that's a variable barometer. So that's 3D printing. And um, as it gets back, let me steal one of these just to hold up to the camera. So what I was talking about physical physical impossibility. Uh, let me know if you get busy. You guys see that? So you'll notice all these little gears. Seriously, can you guys see that? It's not a portal. Okay, two row, two row contrast. Okay, we'll fix that. So uh, let me just point out these gears. See the gears spinning? Uh, this is one solid structure. There's nothing else in it. You're, it's not assimilable. It's physically impossible to do. It. If you said, hey, I want to do this out of steel, you just couldn't do it. If it wasn't 3D printed, because it's just impossible. It's like, if you wanted to build a seamless sphere and then another seamless sphere inside of it, you could. But you could 3D print it. Um, so that's partly why 3D printing is really cool, is because you do things that you just can't do with your own two hands. The other thing that we're going to be doing laser cutting. So laser cutting is the process of taking a laser and burning the hell out of objects. And it removes it very precisely. So go ahead um, to let's see. Why don't you pass these down? So these are laser cut gears that Rob just cut for us. They're fresh off the press. And if for some reason this keeps you over, it's not personal, just raise your hand. It's okay to smell them. I noticed them if you do that. Yep. Oh, yeah, I forgot. Don't taste them. They're passing them. We only have a fourth of the required gears, so share with your neighbors. Basically, oh, hey, yeah, I'm getting done. We're going to do one per row. Sorry, I forgot. Okay, here's your row. Here's your row. So everybody go ahead and spin these and pass them around and sniff them, but not too hard, please. <laughs> we should have had you sign a waiver for sniffing things. Okay, if your row has more than one gear, just pass them to another gear. Or the row. Yes. Okay. So everybody, uh, everybody who does not have a gear in your row, please raise your hand. Anybody? Nope. Okay. So 
the rest are extra. So, disseminate amongst yourselves, please. There you go. Start passing these back. Okay, so what you'll notice here is a couple of things. It's plywood, and plywood has a remarkable um, strength to weight ratio, and then it's super strong and it's super lightweight, and that's awesome. The other thing is that um, they smell bad. That's unfortunate. So the first thing you're going to need to learn is after you do anything mechanical, you wash your hands. And then you wash them again, and you wash them a third time until you can't smell or detect any trace of anything because it will probably give you cancer. <laughs> um, it, it does actually have from out of high so you want to wash your hands. Um, so take your gear and wiggle it. So first thing you notice is that they roll very smoothly. I guarantee you this is as smoothly as you're going to get if you just buy gears, except the fact that I pressed the pieces of wood. But the, the rolling, the dimensions are spot on. I mean, we get down to, um, so in, in, if you're in the U.S. and you do machining, you use units of uh, inches, which is terrible, but then you use one thousandth of one inch, which is very small. But it's not really, because then you start going to one tenth of uh, one thousandth of one inch. And so the laser cutter that we use can get down to that. So if, uh, if you notice, so I just took the gear off, and that's not a big deal. I can't take the pin out because it's press fit. Press fit means that I've forced it in there, I've actually squished some of the material out of the way, and basically the, the um, elastic uh, forces trying to push the pin out are actually holding it in. And now I can pop it back in, and there's no harm done because this is a slip fit. So in my in my SOLIDWORKS model, they're actually the exact same hole, but on the laser cutting machine, I just select the tolerance I want. So you can select down to whether you want a press fit or a slip fit or how, how smooth a slip fit. Uh, so that's laser cutting. So, to review, we're doing 3D printing, we're doing laser cutting, and then we're doing sort of hand foolish things um, and uh, things like using the grinder and the chop off saw, etc. Okay, so um, I'm looking around a little bit, but we're going to get back. So this now begins the official part of my indoctrination. I can see you're putting on some nice gulag music and having a, uh, a swirling helix for this, but I decided to speak softly instead. So, um, the reason why you want to take this class, even if you're not a mechanical engineer and you don't plan on building robots, is because to be a good roboticist, you basically need to be um, at least decent at four areas. They are theoretical uh, framework, so kinematics, you know, forward and inverse kinematics, utopians, force calculations, dynamics, all that good stuff. That's a given, you understand you're going to be doing that. Uh, then you need software, because robots don't just move themselves, hopefully. Uh, if you want a chess playing robot, someone has to tell it to go to F4. So C++ is what most robots use, you need to be proficient at that. Electronics. Um, motors have two wires, but something has to give them current in, in an intelligent way to follow software commands. And finally, mechanical design. You have to build the robot. Uh, so, in the future, you're probably going to be working on interdisciplinary teams where you have an expert from each of these uh, you know, four things. Um, and if you wish to communicate with them effectively, you need to understand their jargon. I could go on endlessly with acronyms and words that sound funny and might be rooted in Latin. And no one would understand me, and that would be bad because then the software guy would be scratching his head and just coding whatever he wanted. Conversely, um, if there's a fundamental lack of understanding about what it is that we each do in our various uh, you know, fields of expertise, it's really hard to work together. So um, an example is backlash. So you all have gears. So what I want you to do is uh, go ahead and hold one of, hold the big one with your thumb really rigidly. Don't let it move. And then wiggle the little one back and forth, not much force, and notice that you can in fact what? So the fact that you can wiggle it is due to the fact that it has to wiggle. If your gears didn't wiggle, they wouldn't turn. They would just be stuck ever fighting each other's teeth. Um, so let me switch over to this. Um, okay, so this is a USB microscope. So these are the gears. This is the way zoomed in. So I'm going to clamp this one here. I'm going to do a better job of clamping this. Okay, watch the teeth. See that? See that play? What's the 
turn that foot. Back latch. Okay. So here's the problem. Right here, it's in contact with the teeth. You see that? Okay. And now here, it is what? Not in contact. And then here, it is in contact. Is this linear? No. No. Unless I put some way of sensing on both sides, which is really expensive, can I detect it? No. Uh, modeling won't help because I can't actually detect it. So basically, if I want to figure out the angle of this big gear and the little gear, then I need some way of measuring the angle of both of them. But even if I did that, nonlinear controls, and this isn't even like a nice, smooth, continuous function that's not linear. This is, um, uh, this is these guys. This is terrible. So um, you can't just control this away. And I have heard many CS students say, no problem, machine learning, give us some backpack, we're going machine learn the shit out of it, it's going to be awesome. <laughs> it doesn't work. It doesn't work. And they come back to us and say, hey, why did you give us backpack? And we say, hey, because gears have backpack. They're cheap. We use gears because they're cheap and they have backpack and you need to learn to deal with that. And because of this, you as CS people and me as a mechanical engineer, we need to mutually uh, you know, agree that backlash exists and we can't control for it, but you know, we'll have other fixes we can learn down the port. So that's why everybody, even if you don't plan on building robots or buying them, but even if you're just going to work with people who build robots, you need to understand their jargon and some amount of theory for what it is. So um, my next lesson of indoctrination is, uh, uh, this is really indoctrination. What are we going to teach you, and how are we going to decide what we're going to teach you? So I told you earlier that the main goal of the class is in the end you're going to be building a four to five degree of freedom. The acronym being DOF, DOF, DOF. Okay, so from now on I'm just going to say DOF. A four to five DOF robot arm that can pick stuff up. The reason being, A, it's awesome, and you'll be excited about it hopefully, and B, if you can build that type of robot, you can build most types of robots. That's not to say that others won't be harder, they will, but it's pretty representative. You'll use the same mechanical widgets and motors and software, etc. So, the goal being a 4 to 5 DOF robot arm, we're going to go backwards and plan the lectures and labs accordingly to teach you everything you know to build that. So the thing is that mechanical engineering of the various engineering is really old, and you can again see this on YouTube. Uh, there are some crazy stuff you've been doing since before there were computers uh, or even people pressing buttons really quickly. And um, if we taught you all of the, all there is about gears, you'd never get out of this room. They've literally been writing dissertations and books about nothing other than the shape of gear teeth, the mathematical shape of gear teeth, which is crazy math for hundreds of years. Uh, but this won't help you build a robot arm. This will just be boring. Um, so we're not going to teach you that. So the thing is, if, if we're going over electrical like gears and you say, hey, um, I heard about an involute tooth versus a cycloidal tooth profile, I'm going to say, congratulations, we're not going to be covering that because it doesn't help you build a robot arm. So just so you know, you will discover things that we're not teaching you about. It may seem incomplete. I apologize for that. But uh, it doesn't further our goal. And you have, they've been doing it for hundreds of years. You have, on average, 78 or 72 to you know, learn all of that. So for, for these three months, you're going to be doing only things strictly related to the robot arm design. OK, so that's how we're deciding what to teach you. <clears throat> Back to indoctrination. So what, uh, what makes for good mechanical design, in, in my um, humble opinion, and again, I, I might be fooled, but this is just what, what I have experienced. Uh, details matter. It doesn't mean you have to be a detail-oriented person to be a good mechanical designer. It does mean that while you're designing mechanical widgets, you have to be ruthlessly vigilant about small details. If there are details that you think probably don't matter, they probably do. If there are details you think that in the end it won't matter, it'll just sort of work. I'll just put my hand on the antenna and then I won't have fuzzy receptor. It won't work. There's no focus focus in mechanical design. These are real things that I can measure with a microscope, uh, with calipers. Um, that I can cut, that I can bend, that these are not the, the um, wi invisible whizzings of electrons inside the tube that you can't see with your own eyes. I can see it. And as such, it, you can't fudge it. Uh, especially once you start doing some of the more advanced stuff, there's just no getting around it. Details matter. Now, what level of detail? Um, let's start out with an example. I have, actually, do you 
guys, everybody here who knows what a ball bearing is, raise their hand, please. Oh, well, that's actually really good. Okay. Well, I'm going to pretend I didn't see that, and I'm going to hand out a bunch of ball bearings anyway. <laughs> please act like you've never seen them. So, um, I do need these back, because you're going to be using them, like, on Wednesday. Um, so, basically, only take one bearing, and then uh, we'll you pass back. Only take one bearing. They're not numbered or radio ID, but I would like them back. So, these are ball bearings. Okay. If you don't have one, start poking people next to you to do. And if you still don't have one, raise your hand and I'll give you one. Okay, so um, basically, uh, I have to jump around a little bit, and you'll see why a little bit later. It's, it's a little bit of a it's a little bit of a back and forth story about how all this works. Okay. So, can anyone tell me why I'm giving you all, well, let me rephrase, um, what are ball bearings good for? Will they rotate? Anything else? A little bit of a Of sort? Yeah, okay. Um, sure. So imagine you didn't, uh, what, 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 do, what do ball bearings facilitate? What do they allow us to do? Say I had a shaft and I wanted to move it. Why would I use a ball bearing? You reduce friction. Okay, I reduce friction. Very good. I can strain motion. It, it rotates where I want it to rotate. So, um, the, there are two main goals in the mechanical design of robots. We're either going to be trying to get motion, or we're going to be trying to get force, or some combination of them, in which case you're very unlucky. But basically, it's motion and it's force. Examples of force are, does anybody here know what haptics is? Okay. So haptics, basically, for those of you who aren't, not in your heads, is um, uh, there's a virtual environment in a computer, and you want to touch it and feel the squishy cube. Uh, but you can't, because the last your hand is not in the computer. So we build a device, we plug it in, and um, it measures your positions, and when you touch something on the screen in the virtual world, it whirs a motor and then moves your hand. So it records your thumb is here, it asks the computer if you're in contact with a squishy cube. If you are, it calculates what a real squishy cube would feel like, whirs the motor, and gives you a torque or force on your hand that really does feel like a squishy cube. And another day we can have demos, you can come back down to the lab and check it out. It's really cool. This is one of the few areas in robots where you're wanting to command what? Force. Pretty much everything else is what? Exactly. So when, you, when, you, when people say, hey, I build robots, they mean I control motion. And that's why a lot of companies that sell mobile components are things like motion control industries or smooth motion, some strange acronym involving motion. Um, so there are two main types of motion, which are rotary and what? Linear. Linear, okay? So we're either prismatic or linear, moving in a straight line, or we're twisting. Those are the two main robotic joints. Those are the two practical main robotic joints. And so basically ball bearings are the golden standard for uh, helping us achieve good rotational motion. And most of the time, when you're building something that is rotational motion, and we'll get into that later in the quarter, but ball bearings help you do it uh, well because it constrains the motion precisely, and it's very low friction, and so you're not losing all of your energy to rubbing against the, the, Basically, the alternative is a plain bearing. So let me show you what the inside of those wonderful things that you're holding is. So this is a ball bearing, again, from the Encyclopedia of Wikipedia. So this internal thing here is called the inner race. This is the outer race. These are the balls. I don't know what the right dot is. That's for sure. This is where the shaft is. And so um, the reason why this is a good method of supporting rotational motion is because they're rolling. And as we all know, rolling friction is less than what? Sliding, Sliding friction, yes. So the other version of this would be, say we got rid of the balls and the outer uh, race, and we just have this little piece of thin metal and the shaft. 
And if tolerances are right, such that they're not colliding, we can still rotate, right? But then we'd have one. Sliding friction, and that would be terrible. Um, so this is a ball bearing. So now we've covered that in robotics, we're either doing forces or we're doing motion. If we're doing motion, rotary or linear. If we're doing rotary, we're probably going to use a ball bearing. And you're holding a ball bearing, so you can see that, in fact, they are very low friction. So this is all getting back to details, because I have this 8 millimeter shaft. And I have this 8 millimeter shaft. And so my question for uh, the brightest amongst you is given that this is an 8 millimeter shaft, what is the diameter of the shaft? And if I told you this already, please don't. Anybody? 8 millimeter shaft, what's the diameter? There you go. So it depends on the tops. When we say that something is a certain size, we always need a plus or minus what? As in, it's 8 millimeters plus how many microns? Minus how many microns? microns being 10 to the minus 6 meters. So when you buy something, and I got these both off of McMaster, um, if you don't look at the fine print where it says what the plus and minus is, it won't fit. And here's the example. This rod is plus or minus 13 microns. So um, just real quick. Thirteen microns is half of one thousand of one inch. That's really small. You, it, it's really tiny. And when you, you all get calculated, you'll see. So this is plus or minus uh, thirteen microns. This is plus zero minus nine microns. This is an ABEC one bearing. ABEC is a basically international uh, tolerance that says what that plus and what that minus is. When someone says it's ABEC five, you say, oh, okay, I know what shaft I need to get because I know what the plus and the minus could be. So um, this one that is plus zero and minus nine microns, it's a little tough to get on, but in the end, so can all of you see me sliding this along? Mm -hmm. And you can probably hear that nasty pseudo uh, fingernails on the chalkboard sound. So that's a pretty tight fit, but that's called a slip fit because, uh, or almost an interference fit, because we're able to get it on there. We don't have to use a hammer or press or anything. So this is eight millimeters, and this is eight millimeters. And I'm not going to try too hard because then I really will need a hammer. It doesn't fit. It doesn't go on. And so we're talking about numbers so small. Let's actually, let's actually divide out. So 0 0.09 divided by 8 is, um, wow, that's small. Yeah, yeah, yeah I'm just reading. So um, 9 microns divided by 8, that's point. 0011. That's tiny. And yet, it's the difference between this shaft fitting and this shaft not fitting. As part of the lab, I'm going to give you both. And you're going to get to modify the shaft until it does fit. And after that, you will understand why you always, always, always want to A, check what you're ordering first to make sure it will work, and B, when it doesn't work, um, basically say, hey, let me figure out why it doesn't work so I never order this bad part again. So this is an example of details that, and I had mechanical engineers come and sit telling me that it doesn't matter, very small numbers, but again, you're going to be sanding this for about a half an hour before it fits. Whereas this one just fits. I know because I did that on Wednesday, and it was terrible. So um, details really, really matter. Um, so that is, that is all of the indoctrination for now. Uh, it has pretty high toxicity, so I don't want to. Uh, no, there's one last one. Okay, cool. So, um, and we're going to get this out on, on the first day. When mechanical designers get together, they size each other up, um, basically by saying, which is your least favorite design component? So, like, hey, you like worm gears? And if they say, yeah, like worm gears, like, you suck. Worm gears suck. <laughs> it's not true. And you shouldn't do that. So I have shown you in this lab all the gears that I think are useful for, you know, common and even somewhat uncommon applications. So we've got a worm gear here, we've got helical, we've got spur and bevels, etc. And they all have things that they are terrific for. They, we, they all have things that they're the only thing for. And then we have applications where they're completely inappropriate. 
And so I don't want any of you talking to other mechanical engineers or other designers and getting in your head that one, one thing is bad, this widget should never be used, because that's not true. I've used all of these. And I can tell you that worm gears are in fact the only way of doing certain joints. Um, amongst all these gears, can anyone tell me the one unique characteristic of this here worm gear? One way. It's one way. It's not back driving. That is, if I turn if I turn the input shaft of one of these and turn the output shaft, they both move. On the worm gear, if I turn the output shaft, it doesn't move. Now, given the um, the demos we've had before, can anyone tell me um, why a worm gear might be bad? No. Uh, okay, well, that, that's almost. Uh, I'll save you save you the answer. It's backlash. Uh, worm gears often have very high backlash, and also some of you are correct, the inefficiencies depending on the detail can be very bad. So, my next point about, uh, say, you get into a pissing match with a mechanical designer about uh, the relative goodnesses or badnesses of worm gears. Here's the argument. So they're going to say, well, worm gears have lots of backlash, and backlash is bad, okay, because it's, 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 it's low precision. So my question is, when is backlash good and when is backlash bad, and when is it acceptable? Backlash is good because it lets gears move. So if you have spur gears, you have to have backlash. If you don't, they won't move. Uh, it's bad if you're trying to do something real precise where you need to control very precisely the output of, of your shaft. Um, so what I'm going to do here is a little strange and you know hopefully it will work. Um, the first, first thing I'm going to show you so this is something I built in my first summer here at Stanford. This was one of the wheels for the omnidirectional base for the PR1 that turned into the PR2 and um, it has gear motors, it has, it has motors plus a gear head that applies the torque and reduces the speed to a belt to a wheel. You can all see these wheels. Now listen, everyone be very, very quiet and listen for a clicking noise. Everybody hear that? That's the sound of backlash. That is the key hitting against each other. That is that nonlinear jump as they go from free space to colliding. And does, does everyone fairly confident. Uh, I'm, I'm going to show you with that terrible webcam again. Um, can you even see that? That's really small. You barely see it, right? You see my finger moving. That's a backlash. It's barely there. So here's the thing. If you build a robot wheel, it's going to have slippage because, well, robot wheels slip. And the backlash is going to be probably smaller than the wheel slippage, and really you can't do very good dead reckoning with rubber wheels anyway, so it doesn't matter. And if you go to some quirky way, real expensive, quirky, mechanical, complicated way of getting zero backlash, which I tried to do in my foolishness here early on, you're just wasting your time. It's tiny compared to the, the losses from wheel slippage. So here, backlash is perfectly acceptable, and if you try to get rid of it, really you'd just be wasting your valuable time and money. Okay, so the second thing, and everyone loves these, the Google car uses a laser scanner. The laser scanner moves around. Well, lots of vanity image research involves laser scanners, and so, you know, you're just, you got um, something that's holding the laser and moving around. And um, so I'm going to flip this on. Okay, um, tell me when everyone can see the laser dot, please. I've got my eye. Okay, so everyone see the laser dot? So I'm going to hold this rigidly. Can you guys see that moving? That's not that much. Everybody see it moving? Okay. Well, I'm on the dial. I'm trying. Okay, everyone see that? It's not very much. It's really pretty small. Let's measure it. So, does everyone know what these are? Yeah. Calibers. This is how you're measuring everything in the course. Um, all right. So. It's about five millimeters. That's not that bad. So now I'm going to unplug this. We're going to go take this little trip and visit Rob. Okay. Now, normally when we're driving,
driving the car around the neighborhood, we're not 12 inches from whatever we're surveying. That's called stalking. <laughs> for Google, legally, we have to stay on the street. And so we're going to be a good 40 feet from whatever it is that we're viewing. We don't have 40 feet here, but we can get a good fraction of it. And um, Wow, so now it's not even visible. Okay. okay, so I'm going to do the exact same thing. Is that bigger? That looks pretty big to me. That looks like we're, we're going to be missing people's uh, you know, knobs and doorknobs and the numbers to their houses and if their window might be a crack. So that's big. So this is an instance where backlash up close really wasn't a problem at all. Uh, and for the wheel, really was completely non-existent. And here, it's gigantic, but it's the same gears. So why is it, you know, can we really say that backlash and spur gears is good or bad? No, we can't, because for one, one purpose it was perfect, and for the other it didn't make a lick of difference. <coughs> Thus ends um, indoctrination. As far as everyone is concerned, everything is completely application dependent in terms of its inherent goodness or badness. It's really just suitability for whatever it is. Okay, so at this point, why doesn't everybody kind of get up and stretch and do the mambo or something? Because my, my, my knees are hurting, and basically halfway through each lecture, we're going to do this so that no one, you know, gets a blow up. Uh, what do you estimate the weekly time commitment for this class to be? Large. So, um, do you have a number? Or? I don't. This, okay. is, this is the first time it's ever been taught. It's my first time ever teaching. Um, and I'm afraid to give you a hard and fast number because we're going to be blowing through it. Okay. So, uh, how many people here have had project classes? Yeah, so you can, you can interpolate based on your past experiences. This could be a lot of work. Mechanical design is very hard work. It's not only the brain power, it just takes flying the seat of one's pants in the seat of one's chair for, for long hours. So, a um, couple of things. Um, some of you come from radically different backgrounds. We've looked at a lot of people that have uh, signed up, which is really great. And one of the things uh, my thesis advisor told me when I was here as a student, he said, the only dumb question is the one you don't ask. So when you hear terms like CAD or backlash or uh, game bandwidth product or something that doesn't quite make sense, it's okay to ask at the point of this class. Um, you both, both of you got bearings, and you know the ideal bearing takes a shaft, you've got some balls here, and a little support structure for it. This is a ground symbol here when I draw the little, little hatch things, so that's the ground. And so you've got this shaft. And the purpose of a bearing is to constrain the shaft to be in a certain place and to allow motion in a different way. So it's a combination of <coughs> constraint and freedom. So the, the ideal uh, bearing that's holding a shaft here in a race um, is going to make this shaft pull perfectly along this axis. And it's going to allow it to turn friction free. So an unperfect bearing is going to have some problems, like it's going to be able to tilt back and forth this way, so the shaft isn't exactly aligned like this. Um, another thing you can do is allow the shaft to move up and down, so the different kinds of play, play meaning gaps in, in, uh, in the motion and constraint. Um, and then the other thing, well, the other, other direction, you can slide this way, but maybe that's an okay thing because you want to put it together and you don't care if it slides back and forth. Um, where it's not trying to slide back and forth. And then the other thing is the friction. When you try to when you try to turn this thing, does it allow it to turn or not? If you had a, a plain bearing or a German bearing, it's really the same. You just had a shaft and pole, which is the way they used to do it in the old days. Uh, maybe they grease up the wood with, um, I don't know, some kind of grease. Um, you get a certain amount of friction. But when you put the balls in there, as we were showing, then you get much lower friction. But there's still friction because when these balls roll, there's various sources of friction, whether it's the ball compressing, whether it's uh, lubricant in here that's kind of viscous and slows it down. So, so when you take your bearing, you might pick it up and kind of see if you can feel both the geometric uh, inaccuracies in it. If you take the inner race and grab it, you can feel that it wobbles a little bit, both circularly around this way and also wobbling back and forth. And you saw that these are pretty good bearings. And then the other thing to feel is when you try to turn it, 
maybe it's easy to fold the center and then roll the other side. It's not perfectly frictionless. If, you, if it was perfectly frictionless, you'd, you'd roll it, and it would keep rolling forever until the air resistance slowed down. But there's already something in there that's resisting its motion. It's probably lubricant. Maybe if there's a heavy load on it, it's going to be worse because the load tries to squish the balls in there and they deform and dissipate energy. Um, so these are good things for you to learn to feel. You pick up a bearing. You can tell the difference between a good one and a bad one by how much it wobbles this way, how much friction you feel. And, um, and that's one of the many kind of things that we're trying to get across here. Uh, so Kim actually has a very apt uh, introduction to our next topic. So here's the deal. Um, the first thing we've got to learn about is bearings. And I don't want to uh, waste uh, lecture time by uh, giving you the questionnaire and then you go home early because I'm statistics. So um, we're going to learn a little bit about bearings. And then the next lecture, having learned about bearings, we're going to then use them to support gears. So you're all holding bearings. And don't worry, I have my alarm clock set for uh, 5.40. It takes 20 minutes. Then you're out with five minutes to spare by the end of the lecture. If I go beyond 5.40, Please someone stop me and do the questionnaire. So the first lesson is, is, has everyone actually touched the bearing? If not, please touch your bearing. Yeah, touch it. Feel it rotation. Okay, so the next thing I'm going to hand out is um, the remedy for having touched said bearing. Which is Athens. Because you're all greasy by now. I came greasy, but that's because I've been in the shop all day. So half and half, go ahead and wash your hands off. Again, once you're done, don't get cancer, wash your hands. Um, and this is perhaps the last time you'll see me in a college shirt, mainly because I ruin everyone I bring into the lab because of the grease. So um, let's talk a little bit about bearings. So you can see here the rolling friction of, so the two main types, plain bearings and no ball bearings. Plain bearings, there are no balls. That's what differentiates it. That's why we call them ball bearings. Uh, ball bearings are a lot better. Everyone uses them. Plain bearings are basically when you just don't have any room or it has to be ridiculously cheap, which is a very different discussion. Um, so if we were looking at that ball bearing right there, I would tell you that that uh, is an open bearing. Can anyone tell me why I would say that's an open bearing? Because the balls can fall out. Well, they can't fall out, but you can see them. You're, you're almost there. Uh, it's open if you can see them. Uh, and what's the problem with having an open bearing? Yeah, so uh, the next lab I'm going to bring a giant back of sand and we're going to put some bearings in there and ruin them so you guys can feel what that feels like. So uh, this is part of the reason why we have to keep it clean in the shop is every time you get anything, a little chip of aluminum or delrin or sand in there, because we use a lot of sand, um, it's going to ruin your bearing and that's bad. So uh, the solution to this is the bearings in your hands. Some of you have black bearings, some of you have silver bearings, I'm not sure what ratio I gave you. The silver ones are called shielded bearings. They have little metal shields in them that keep junk from getting in there. Uh, and then the black ones are sealed. So let me let me um, use my terrible camera. And use okay. Good. Good. Okay. So can everyone see these two? See how the top one is uh, sort of goldish. Top one is black. So uh, this one here is called shielded. This one is uh, is sealed. Sealed actually means you're not even getting stuff with water in there. It's actually keeping the lubrication. In. They, they use a low viscosity oil in there um, to to minimize heat, uh, dissipate it, to keep everything happy. It's like having oil for your car. You really only need that if you're in a really nasty environment, like an industrial robot, um, and if you're going at really high speeds. Uh, the, the downside of having seals, especially if it's such a tight contact that they won't even let water, is what? Anybody know? Friction. Yes. So uh, the more that we, the tighter we press against the, the inside and outside of the bearing, such that we can't even get you know oil out or water in, means we have more friction. Well, this doesn't really matter. This is another one of those good bad things, right? It's like okay, friction is bad. Well, yeah, but it doesn't matter in some instances. If you have an industrial robot that's moving um, I don't know, somewhere in, in a forklift, it doesn't matter. The forces you're doing with are huge from your friction. If you're doing a haptic device where you're trying, say, for a microsurgical simulation like we do in our lab, the forces are very small and important. And if you're losing it in the friction, you're screwed. Because, like, I don't know, maybe a tenth of your force 
uh, is getting lost in the friction between the, the seal and the bearing. Um, so, uh, what are the three uh, the three sort of seal variants that we have on ball bearings? Can anyone name them? Three of them. Now we can. We've got open. I know I'm not this boring. <laughs> shielded and sealed. Open, shielded, and sealed. Most of the time you want shielded. They sort of split the difference. Open, you're going to screw up your bearings. You really will. There are very few applications where they're warranted. Uh, Haptics is sometimes you want. Sealed is overkill. I got sealed because basically my bearing suppliers couldn't source 900 bearings in one week, so that's why I got half and half. Um, so going back to this picture, this is the outer race. This is the inner race, these are the balls, this is where the shaft goes. Um, most of the time, when you install a bearing in something, you're clamping onto the outer race, and you're letting this inner race just, you know, run on the next to the shaft. The idea being that any friction between the shaft and the inner race is going to be so much lower than the friction of these balls that it'll just roll rather than slide. Um, so now, let me come back and show you this. And um, so uh, another thing, um, please feel free to just raise your hand and ask questions. I won't fight. And uh, as this is the first time the course has ever been taught, I actually can't see this very well. You need to let me know if it's like this looks terrible, for instance. That would be good criticism. Um, so this is a bearing that I press fit into the MDF. And as you can see, there's only one bearing. Can everyone see this pretty clearly? There's only one bearing. So, as Kim said, there's a problem with bearings. And Kim's done quite a nice picture. I'm going to draw a little bit bigger. So, drawing is something that you guys need to become proficient at in this class because this is how people communicate in mechanical design is on the back of napkins. Our pockets are always filled with napkins because our hands are always greasy. Um, Okay, so the lines basically mean this is a solid object. Okay. So this is the what? Actually, these are the what? So let's zoom in here. I'm going to erase this. It actually looks a lot more like this. When you draw bearings, there's no reason to put little details in there. So basically, uh, one of you said if you open it'll fall out. And these detents are the reason why it doesn't fall out, because if we didn't have the detents, they fall out. So this detent, as you can see, if I'm going to zoom in here real quick, this is a gigantic detent, and this is cartoonish for a reason. If we move, if I held this outer race really rigidly, and someone tell me what this means. Ground! Anytime you see ground, it means it's not moving, it's stationary. So uh, if I hold this uh, like this, and then I take and shift it this way, here is sort of, uh, this is too bad, this is a bad cartoon. Um, okay, so here's the ball in sort of the zero location. Now someone tell me something obvious about this picture in terms of how large this ball is compared to this race. It's smaller. It has to be smaller so that it can actually move. If it were the exact same size, it would jam up and nothing would move. Now, what's the problem with this being smaller is that I can have alternate locations. I can move it that way, or I can move it that way. And so this is going to be some delta. Uh, actually, let's, what do you think would be a good, a good name for this? Like a, a little letter we'll use. Two direction of, of bearings are radial and axial. So we'll call this A. So um, this is radial, and this is axial. This is important because when you look up a bearing and you see, is this strong enough to take the forces of my hammer chucking robot, uh, it will tell you the specs for axial and radial, and so that will let you know if it, it has it. So that's the core of the bearings. So we've got some delta A here, and that's play, and that's bad because I told you that bearings are supposed to constrain motion as, as well as, as make it smooth. Um, and because of this, as Kim said, I can take this inner race and I can twist it. So now my axis is cocked at some angle here. So uh, anyone
on what do you think we should do to get rid of its ability to cock back and forth? Sure. All right, and your name? John. So John just recommended that we can, we constrain it in multiple points, which would mean what? Two bearings. Okay. And say we said, hey, two bearings work really well. I'm going to throw more in there. Let's do three or four. That would that'd be bad. It would be over-constrained. It would be like having a five-legged, oh, actually a four-legged table. So three-legged tables are kinematically perfect. In four legs, it's over-constrained, and we thank God for compliance. But um, more than two bearings, unless it's a very, very special, which we probably won't get to here, is bad. So only use two at a time. But two bearings allows us to get rid of that plane. So coming back to uh, our greeny film, now I have two bearings in here. See? Front and back. Now I would put the shaft in with only one and show you the wiggle, but honestly this is a pair of cameras, so it's just going to look the same. So let's go ahead and put a shaft in. We know this one fits. We're going to have uh, a separate sort of subsection of a lecture on basically how to do this. But this is a really nice shaft. It has very good tolerances, it's cut to a proper length, it's chamfered on the ends, there's no crap on it. Uh, this is not. Someone decided to spray paint this yellow, which was a bad idea, and it's not chamfered. And even if it was the correct diameter, it wouldn't fit in. So we'll get back to that another time. Basically, shafts are very expensive when they come nice. And if they don't come nice, which is about half of what you'd be doing, you have to go through a fairly detailed process of cleaning them, sanding them, chamfering them, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So I'm sticking, everyone see this, that's, that's you know, spinning freely, can we see that? Spinning? Yes. So, uh, what's the problem here, what am I missing? I say, um, I don't know, I, I'm just going to hold this and I want to be able to spin this and um, can anyone tell me without seeing what I just grabbed visibly, how you see if a shaft is moving? Hey! Um, I know this This is all super simple, but you'd be amazed how many people I've seen staring at me. Is it moving? I don't know. <laughs> okay. So we have heat. And by the way, can anyone tell me what I just did to this shaft? I just ruined it. Because the adhesive, when I take this off, even though it's microscopic, you might not be able to feel it. We're talking again, the difference between this one is plus or minus 13 microns and this is plus zero minus nine microns. My adhesive is way bigger than my tolerance. But then you're going to use probably acetone and rubbing it and pluck it off. Um, so anyway, this is shafts are tricky. If you put tape on them to see if they're moving, then you ruin your shaft and have to clean. So just keep that in mind. Okay, so we've got this and it's rotating very smoothly and this is great, we're happy, but what's the problem here? It's sliding. Okay, right. So um, I don't have these to pass around to you, but I will show you. This is a shaft collar. It's about three bucks. You came off with master. And um, so basically the shaft goes in the middle, and we've got a, a little slit there. And this is a screw. So somebody tell me how this works. A little louder. With a hard of hearing, please. I can screw. Tighten the screw. Okay. So can everyone see this light? And now I'm going to um, kind of tighten it, and miraculously it's not sliding. Yeah! Okay. We need a second one. Well, here's the problem. Um, when I go back, let's draw another bearing, this time front on. Um, can everybody see me from over here? Okay. So this is the front side of the bearing. That's the... Yeah, sorry, that's your question. <laughs> okay. Uh, now, what's this one? Okay. So, say my shaft collar, which I need to prevent from sliding around, say I, I, I really want to take some forces. This is hardcore. I'm going to make my, um, my outer, I'm going to make my shaft collar the exact same size as this. But if I had a different color, I would use it. Here's a green one. Well, to all those of you, including myself, who are green, red, colorblind, I apologize. Uh, okay, so 
this is my shaft, however. So this is holding it in place. So what's the problem now? Exactly, because there's one view I haven't shown you of the bearing, and that's when you look on it on the skinny side. So this is what it looks like. So the, by the way, this is a flange bearing. After that, so this is flat, like perfectly flat. Then if you measure calipers, you're not going to tell a difference. So if you put a shaft collar that is this big here, and the shaft collar is just trying to touch the inner ace, you're also touching the outer ace, which means there's no point in using a bearing. So can anyone think of how we might go? First, let me ask this. Does everyone, does everyone understand what I'm yammering on about here? Does everyone get the issue here? Let, let's go back to this. I'm holding the outer race and the inner race is moving. Everyone take your bearings, hold the outer race, stick your, your pinky finger in the inner race and rotate. And I have to clean your fingernails. Okay, so um, now take another finger and put it across the inner race and the outer race and try to rotate. And you will see that not remarkably, it doesn't spin very freely anymore, see? That is, to, ro to use the bearing for smooth rotation, you can only touch the inner race. And when we put this collar on here that's too big, we're touching both the inner race and the outer race. So, what is the solution for this? Okay. Well, we could use a small collar. Say we can hold, say there's like, I don't know, a donation of super huge collars and we don't want to hurt the donor's you know, feelings. So then what would we do? Spacers. Yep. So spacers are really, really thin, uh, depending on the spacer, and very precise washers. Washers are just really cheap and ugly um, shims. Everyone see this? Okay. So this is like a washer. Uh, this is on the side. You can't even really see it. This one is pretty big. This is 0.5 millimeters. Uh, they sell these down to 0 0.01 millimeters. So that is smaller than the diametral tolerance So I'm going to do first I'm going to move over here. Can someone please flick on the lights? I'm going to a little bit of a vampire in here. So we're going to mount a fire drawing. Someone can yell out what I'm drawing as I yell, please. That was long. <laughs> What's this? A. Okay. These? A. I know it seems silly, but you will always need that one. Okay, what's this? Just a quick comment. <clears throat> you keep seeing this kind of symbolic stuff here. It means oh. different things in different contexts. What he's illustrating is he's taking bearing and cut through the half. So this is the cut surface that's revealed and cut through half. Yes, visualization. There's a lot of sort of visual vocabulary that's coming in. Sorry, I kind of forgot that. Is it, does this make sense, everybody? We're just cutting the bearing in half? Okay. So uh, our drawing now, we're going to um, now say this is our, our shim. So how big can the shim be? Where should I draw the line? Anybody? Just not touching this. Okay. Everybody see this is actually a ring. But I'm just cutting it in half. <coughs> and now I can put my big old fat washer here under no problem. And I'm going to do it on both sides. why we're doing this because I've been staring at this for years, but this is a little weird at first. So this is the shaft collar. This is the outer race. Can everyone read my handwriting? Okay. Um, this, uh, let's see, inner race, <laughs> the people 
like to go there on the weekends. I'm not sure. Uh, these are balls. Yes. And this is um, a shim or, and, and so uh, as an aside, and there will be, the aside will decrease uh, in the time of the um, Half of the mechanical zone is what the hell you call it. You can't buy it if you don't know what to buy it. You can't tell if it's not to sell it if you don't know what it's called. This is called an inner race. Spacer, shim, washer, all types of things. Also, it could be called a bearing and then add into those there. It's really annoying. Basically, you're looking for something that's super high tolerance. If, it, if it's super high tolerance and it has the word bearing and, sh and some combination, that's, that's what you want. So that's the shim. Uh, so is this clear? So uh, this is the inner race, outer race, the balls. This is the shim separating the collar from the inner race of the weak end that hits with it. You said you want something really high tolerance. Why do you want something really high tolerance? Here? Thank you for asking. You don't always. This is another application independent. So um, a lot of times it doesn't matter. Sometimes it really matters. So some of the stuff, say we had two bearings and two gears, helical gears. And um, let me draw that on here. So this is our plate. And we've got one gear here. Can everyone see that this is a gear? These are different lines now. It's confusing, but that's a gear. This is a helical gear. And then um, we have another one. So these are helical gears. Okay, and this is a rotational axis. <coughs> and just in case that's a terrible drawing, which maybe I'm talking about these two white gears here. Can everyone see these rotating? Everyone? Okay, so those are the gears. So, uh, they actually need to be, you know, at the, the same height. It's important. And if they're not, they don't work quite right. So, here, of course, if we zoomed in, we'd see half of this. We'd see a baron and a shim and then a gear, or some other permutation. So basically, there would be something separating the inner race from our gear, from the back end of our gear. Okay. Now, if I have one shim that is 0.5 millimeters plus or minus 0.5 millimeters, wouldn't be that. Little joke. Plus or minus 0.2 millimeters. And then we had another one that was 0.5 millimeters plus or minus 0.0001 millimeters, which again they won't sell. It's very tiny. Basically, one of them is probably going to be a different height than the other, and that difference in height is going to mean your gears don't turn quite well. So, if it is uh, something like this, where they need to be at uh, a proper spacing, they have to be high tolerance. And high tolerance is dependent on what the tolerance of the gears are. If it doesn't, say these are spur gears, uh, and I'll jump ahead in the next lecture. Anyone know the difference between these two in terms of helical versus spur? Note that these are these look like twisted lines. One might even say a segment of a helix, or a helical gear. A spur gear, you just get rid of the twist, and they're at 90 degree angle. Those are the laser cut gears. So if we looked above, it would look like this. And you could, those are spur. Yeah, thank you. Um, what's your name? Tim. Tim, okay. Tim. Tim, okay. So Cammy has uh, rightly pointed out you all are holding spur gears. Don't work. And so you can see by those two, take the little one and slide that from the big one, and they still rotate just fine because they're intersecting at a line. This is not, not, this is a section of the curve. Yes? So uh, for this piece that you can have high tolerance for shifting gear? Yes. So what if one of them is the extreme end of the plus tolerance and the other one is the extreme end of the minus tolerance? Is that? That would be bad. So that's why you want to match. Generally, if it's high precision, you want to use matched components. That is, they're of the same tolerance. And it's a tolerance that you know that for your gear will work. So you don't want to. Well, even in that case, though, where one's at the extreme small side and one's at the extreme large size, you want to think about that worst case. And so you design it so they fit together that no matter what combination of good, large, or small, it still works. It means you might have to suffer almost too tight mesh or almost too loose a mesh. But that's yes. what you have to take into account when you're designing it. Exactly. So um, we are almost to the questionnaire, and which is good because I'm at the end of my bearing example. So um, I. 
I'm going to take the shaft collar off and I'm going to put the shims on. Yes? Instead of having a shaft collar, could you just do an interference bit between the, the shaft and the inner race? Yeah. And the So you could. Yeah. Could. Yeah. But what happens with bearings is if you push on them too hard, you do what's called Grinelli, which is you, you plastically deform, you put a little pop mark on the surface of the race, and then every time you uh, go, you rotate against that pop mark, you feel the clunk, 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 clunk. So if you try to press the bearings on, maybe some people do that. I really can't recommend that because it, it will, A, you're going to need to disassemble button B, it's most likely going to destroy your bearing. Now the bearings I've given you guys are some of the most indestructible bearings out there. And I'm almost done, I promise. I will, after one second. So, remember that so we got rid of the, the angle wiggling, like the cocking of the shaft, the two bearings. But here's the thing, these are very precise. If we squish two shaft collars at the exact thickness of the bearing, it's not going to want to rotate. It's, it's just going to be bad. Uh, or, or let me put it this way. Let me draw again. Avert your eyes from that. Remember this picture? Right here? So now I have two bearings. So I'm gonna I'm gonna erase over here and we're just gonna extend this drawing. Okay, so now that bearing ends and then a new bearing begins. These are the two ball positions and we have another delta A. <coughs> um, you don't want to squish metal metal on metal without any springiness in between. It's just bad. I could give you reasons, but I'm just going to let you break some bearings in your first lab and then you'll never forget. It's just bad. You don't want to squish metal on metal, um, except for press fits, which we'll get to another day. Um, you want some springiness in there so that you don't put excessive force. And by the way, if this is the inner race and this is the outer race and this is the ball, Brunelli puts a pop mark here. And now you can imagine free rolling, free rolling, free rolling, pop mark. Um, if I were to take a hammer and just smack the top of the outer race, it would smack this ball into the inside. But it doesn't have to be a hammer from the outside. If I put a shaft in here and then I smack the end of the shaft, like say I held this, well, hang on, I have a hammer, and I um, just smacked that, it would torque the shaft up like this, and that torque would ram the ball into the outer race. So, Brunello can happen either by pop mark from the inner race or the outer race, but either way, you've permanently ruined your bearing, and now it's a cyclical noise. Anytime you hear, like, it's either a chicken being strangled, it's Brunello because you hit your bearing too hard. So, to prevent stuff like this, you don't press with bearings to shafts. You want slip fits. It can even be a little tiny bit interference, but you want the even slip. And the issue is you don't want to clamp here with something that's not elastic because it's just bad. Um, you'll break bearings, uh, your forces will be excessively high. You could Brunel the side too. So imagine I could Brunel here, I could Brunel here, I could Brunel here. So if I actually load too high, it does the same thing. It's just bad. It's, yeah. So, so why don't skateboard wheel bearings Brunel all the time? I think that they expect the size uh, of the Low, I, I don't know, is the honest answer. And the BS answer is probably they expect the size of the loads for the bearings. So if you, uh, every time you use something, you need to make sure it's appropriate for, for what you're doing. Jackhammering, a jackhammering robot is different from a feather lifting robot. Um, so, you know, bearings might be now for the jackhammer, but not for the feather. So the last issue is we want to basically, to get rid of this wiggle here, and we can move both bearings back and forth, we're going to add a spring here that forces the two bearings together. So this is critical, and we're almost done, I promise. Yeah, I got that. We could pick anywhere along here to force these balls to meet. Is that true or false? If we 
put them in the center of the track, which we're going to have play. I want to put this bearing here, a ball here, on this side of the delta A, and I want to put this ball here on this side of the delta A, so that they're squished together, and then my play is gone. And the way I'm going to do it is I'm going to put a spring so that the, for the force is controlled, because, you know, if you control the deflector spring, you control the force. So coming back to this picture, I've got one last thing. I'm going to take out this shaft collar, and I'm going to put a spring. Now, there are many ways of doing this, but one way is called a bevel washer. And basically what it is, bevel wheels are. And then another shim, and then my potentially large shaft collar. This is called a, I, I help, I think this is how you spell it. It's called a Belleville washer. And it's a cone, it's made of like a spring steel. And when you squash it, it squashes flat. So looking from the side, if it's squashed flat, it looks like this, with a hole in the middle. And that's considered preloaded. Then there's a force that wants to, to push against this side, it wants to open up, force F. If it's not preloaded, it looks like this. So basically, this, this is the zero force level. So you can imagine it's, it looks kind of like a, like a cone here. And then if I squash it flat between this, this shim and this shim, now it's flat. And what that force does, does is it forces the, the races to this position and this position, thereby eliminating my axial play and also even more of that cocking play. So, does anyone not get that? And really, this is like, I didn't get this for, I didn't believe it for weeks. It was like figuring out that Tigger was a tiger from Winnie the Pooh and not an alien. <laughs> um, it seems obvious, but it's actually kind of difficult. Does anyone not get why we're using this Belleville washer? Okay, so I'm going to zoom in on the camera real quick. I hope you can see this. That's not going to work. So here's what I'm going to do. Um, I'm not going to lock this shaft collar. I'm going to review. I'm just going to lock one. I'm going to review real quick. I'm going to hand out the entrance exams, and then while we're doing that, people can switch this. Here's what I want you to take away: bearings, rotary motion, very smooth, constrains motion. We have an inner race and outer race. Don't mix them. It's bad. We use them in pairs to get rid of cocking or angular motion. So that it doesn't slide over the place, we use shaft collars to locate actually on the shaft. We need inner shims so that we don't touch the inner race and outer race concurrently. Cool, we're constrained. But we want to get rid of the actual play without burnelling or squishing or permanently deforming the balls, thereby ruining our bearings. We use a Belleville washer. Then we tighten all of it with this last shaft collar and then we're good. So here's what I want you guys to do. Take the two shaft collars between your, your thumbs and your fingers and squish. Squish, squish, squish. And you can see that that little bit of squish is just a little bit of force that's going to constrain the configuration of those balls against each of their respective inner races. Does it going to push the inner race and not the outer race? Because the outer race is grounded against something. Remember, these bearings aren't floating midair. And we're going to go over this in the next lecture again because we don't quite have enough time. Anybody, would you rather fill out a boring questionnaire for another minute or have to understand this? We'll take a poll. <laughs> okay. So, I get one minute too. Yeah. That was a very apt observation, which is what are we doing with the outer races? So, in this block here, I have a block. Okay, and then that's the hole in it. And then I have a bearing here, and there's a flange. Have, we're holding the outer rays, right? They can't move. This is ground, which means that this is ground. Everybody see these outer races can't move? Okay, so this is my inner race. Okay, and right now, because uh, I'm not doing anything to them, I can take the inner races and go wee! I can move them together, I can move them opposite each other, kind of like vibrational modes. So, I'm going to push as hard as I can this way. Does everyone see that if I do that, 
this ball moves to the right, and the ball on the left bearing moves this way. So if I if these are grounded so they can't move, and I touch only the inner races and I squish hard, everybody sees those balls move that way and that way. Okay? Now all I want to do is lock those in place. It might be the other way around. <laughs> so they're against each other, and then we put the bearing shims so that we don't interfere with the two. We put the spring so that it keeps that force, and we lock it down with shaft collar so it doesn't move. What about increase the friction in the bearing? Oh, maybe a little bit. I don't know. Not much. Not enough that you're going to be able to perceive it over the effects of the seal and the shield. Okay, we're going to go back over this because we're not done with bearings. But, uh, Ken's going to uh, say a few words and then we'll do the exam. So I'm, I'm going to tell you something really simple because this course is intended for some of you who, who understand nothing about these drawings. Uh, some of you get part of it, some of you live and breathe it perhaps, and some of you have never, never seen a machine drawing before. So I want to show you something really simple. Um, oh, I need the box. The box of tennis. So, so let's say I'm going to show you what a, what a box with a hole in it looks like. And I'm going to do a drawing of that. So here, here's my box. And I draw, I drill a hole in it here. Okay, that, that's pretty clear. So the, there's a convention that's different in the U.S. than it is in Britain, which is, well, how do I show the other, other sides of this? Do I draw it here? Do I draw it here? Well, the way to think of it is you're rolling this underneath a piece of glass. So I've got this view, which is what we'll call the top view, the side view, it's going to look like this. So roll it under the piece of glass. And so the side view is going to look like this. It's got the same height, but now we're seeing, seeing the width of it this way. Um, now there's a hole there. So how, how do I depict that? Well, these are hidden lines. This is one way to draw it. Um, so it suggests that there's a hole. It doesn't say if it's round or square. You can't tell that. It's really a square hole. It could be a rectangle hole. But it's round in this case, because that information comes from this drawing. And then we can roll it under the piece of glass and show the, the last dimension of it, which is this one. And there's still a hole in it. Here, here. So it comes through here. Now, Ruben, you have been using a lot of uh, what you call section drawings. So you could, I won't ask you to understand too much about this, but you could say, let's cut it on this plane here. And there's a visual vocabulary, visual vocabulary for that. And I'm going to now show you that, that section drawing over here. Now, I, what I've done is I've cut it and I've dropped that piece over here. So now you see where the, the saw, saw marks are and in here. And then this is, this is a, a half pipe. This is the, the whole, what remains of the whole. So you would call this um, section A A. You don't have to get this detailed about it. I just want you to have sort of that, that visual sense of how it rolls underneath the glass and then you roll it under the glass again and you can see it over here. So it's, it's good to look up drafting conditions. Um, yeah, but for the third one, you got to roll over it. Uh, it should be not uh, higher. Yeah. Say again. The dash should be higher. Which are the bottom? The bottom? Yeah, bottom. Yeah, the dash should be higher. The hole? Yeah, the hole. Is that what you mean? <laughs> yeah, that's what we want. I mean, not, some of you get this clearly, and some of you probably have never seen this kind of drawing before. It's just part of the language, and I want to say this. Secondly, I, I've double booked myself. I'm going to have to scoop right now, um, but that's only on Monday, so you're in good hands with you. Thanks, Ken. So, uh, we're going to do questionnaires. By the way, you're correct. It's the opposite side. If you're talking about the race, uh, the detent being on the inner race versus the outer race, if I drew it on the top, it would be the difference. Okay, so um, basically uh, self-explanatory. Please write legibly, I'm not with the runes or anything, letters. Um, everyone should have brought a calendar, hopefully, or at least memorized it, because we need to figure out when you are available for office hours, special lectures, etc. What do I mean by special lectures? That's a good question. Um, you have to learn to use SolidWorks very, very well in this class. 
I don't expect you to do that on your own. We're going to start lab one probably on Thursday evening, if everyone can make it. If not, we'll do some other evening. Because I want to teach you how to do solid works rather than you suffering through a terrible tutorial on your own. I don't know how to co configure my platforms. You can do a bit. You can do a bit. Yeah, so um, once we've handed these all out, I'm going to go over. Let's see. So start handing these down. So that's four. We need four more. Once we hand these out, we'll start going over some of the finer points. I apologize, this is my first lecture ever, so I, I kept you guys beyond what I promised. However, I have to have this because I'm emailing out who's in the class and who's not tonight at midnight. So you're free to go, but I do need this before you go. Again, you have to actually hand this in to me before you go if you want to be in the class. And if we scared you off, I apologize. Anyone not have one? Nobody? Okay. All right. If you're auditing it, I would still like it just because I'd like to know who you are. And so we can tell Stanford that there's interest in this class. The only way they'll allow me to teach it again is uh, if people enjoy it and if there's sufficient interest to warrant us continuing to teach it. So if you're auditing, please still fill it out. And uh, while all of you are seriously scribbling, I'm going to point your attention to just a few points, please, for a sec. Um, you have to have a little laptop. I'm not trying to be mean, uh, but there's just no way to do the work. You can dual boot. You can make something that runs both Linux and Windows. You can make something that runs both Mac and Windows. I personally don't know how to do that, but uh, Google is actually like that. Uh, there's a $150 non-refundable lab fee it has to be paid by a personal check. I can't even cash, it's going to be super sketchy. So if you don't have a personal check, but you do have a friend taking a class, maybe you can give them cash and then they'll write the double check and put your name on it too. I don't know. But it's $150 on the phone with my check. All the rest of it is just trying to let us know what your technical abilities are. The most important thing in terms of the giant list is the calendar. Now, I may have done this confusingly. So, any time that you can and are willing to make it to something related to, to this course, darken it. If you can't make the time, you can blank. For the very last three pages, it's just a long, a long, excessively long list of obscure terms. I won't feel bad. I don't expect many of you to know most of them. I just want to see what you've heard of and what you have. So, the two columns. Have you heard of this term or concept before, yes or no? Have you actually used it hands-on practically, yes or no? Other than that, just fill them out, hand them to me personally. And if you need a pen, I have finite pens, but I'm... Um, because I am being plug and play like not, you need to make sure that I can use your OS. Does No, but I, I need to... Another thing is... So SOLIDWORKS runs on 32-bit and 64-bit, and the same install CD doesn't work on both. So I need to know how many USB keys I need to make of both. So that's why I'm asking. Also, if I can chime in for Mac users, through software licensing, you can get VMware through the university free. So that is an excellent point. And my friends who have done that have not had that experience. Because, um, so basically, if, if you can bring me, uh, actually, the Dreams part has a free version of Windows and the virtual box has a free version. If you guys can figure out how to do it, such that you can actually make large assemblies and solid work work, that's fine with me. I, I don't want to be mean about that. My friends who have run it uh, on emulators on both Linux and Mac have said it's really slow and annoying, and you're going to be spending like 50% of your time using SOLIDWORKS, so it's just going to be like water torture for yourself um, if you screw it up. So if you can bring me your computer with SOLIDWORKS installed, or, or bring, your, bring me your computer and I'll give you the USB key, you can try. But it, it'd be best to dual boot. The cleanest possible solution is to dual boot. 